Hi guys and welcome today is March 30th. Today we're going to be talking about uh, heat again and thermodynamics and all of that. This is an engine, this is a thermal engine that uses heat actually. Let's see if it can, if it starts or not. I turned it on. Yeah. It's supposed to have, I did not fix that part. It's supposed to have this one connected to a, uh, a motor and the motor is supposed to generate the electricity for it. So I didn't get it tight enough for it to work. So, But this is a heat engine. This is similar to what you have in your car, except the one that you have in your car is called an auto engine. That's O-T-T-O. This is going to run super high, so I really have to probably uh, slow down or stop it or something because of the heat that is continuously generated. So what this is, is you have a, uh, let me turn it off. So you have a piston in here that has a gas, and that gas is under the, the heat, so it's going to expand, but it's being pushed from the other engine in here that is in contact with the room temperature, I mean the other piston that is in contact with the room temperature, and this is in contact with the hot source, which is alcohol at 70% uh, basically uh, concentration. And there is an exchange of heat in here at constant volume, so that's what's going on in this engine, so this one is going back and forth. Uh, because of the uh, of this uh, motion in here and there is an exchange of heat in here at constant volume. This is called the Stirling engine, okay? This is a fun engine to demonstrate with the principle of thermodynamics, heat transfer basically, the ones that we're doing right now, okay? Uh, let me switch cameras and before I show you my ugly basically background, let me remove the background in here first. And now we can switch to the other camera. So basically this is the uh, uh, part of the branch that we're studying right now, which is thermodynamics. And I mentioned before thermodynamics has applications in a lot of areas. This the example of this engine was supposed to, because of this rotation, which is a mechanical, converting heat into mechanical energy, which is the energy of rotation in this case, the kinetic energy. You take that kinetic energy, if the string was tight enough on uh, the, the, the motor, it could generate uh, uh, electricity. And uh, that is another form of energy. So basically that's what the purpose of the refrigerator of the, uh, Mode engines is. This is as opposed to the refrigerator which uses different process. It takes heat from a cold source and dumps it into the uh, outside, okay, to the hot source, from the cold source to the hot source. This one takes it from the hot source where the, where the, where the heat was coming from and converts it into and dumps the heat to the other side, to the other piston uh, at cold source. So this is from T hot to T cold. And this is basically a uh, typical engine, okay. That's how engines operate. So uh, you have two types of engines in the industry. The two of them are uh, auto engines, O-T-T-O, the named after the person who discovered the cycle. And the, uh, the other cycle that is actually in use also in the industry for the heavy machinery is the diesel engine by the name of the person who also invented the process, invented the, uh, the, the, the cycle. So those are the two well-known engines in addition to the Stirling engine, which is actually a little bit better than the other two in terms of efficiency, but uh, it's very hard to make an industrial engine out of the Stirling engine. So that's really why it's still kind of a toy, really, not a practical engine to work with. And then in addition to that, there is actually far better than this mentioned, which is called the Carnot engine. Carnot engine is really a, a theoretical engine. You cannot even build a model out of it, let alone uh, having a, re a realistic uh, thing with it. So before we get into a lot of these things, let's continue the topic of heat transfer. The exam, by the way, the midterm is going to be after the, uh, the spring break. After the, yeah, after the spring break, yes. So immediately after that, the week after is going to be the, the, the exam. And it's going to cover chapters 1 through 18, because 18 is the last topic in the, in the thermodynamics. So today is 15, 16, then we will have 17. By Tuesday of next week, we should be ready for the exam. Okay, so let me uh, share with you the screen. Is everybody looking at chapter 16, heat transfer? Yes, no? Okay, very good. So heat transfer itself is a, how heat goes from one location to the other. There are three main ways of, for heat to transfer, three. 
Okay. Two of them require medium, namely conduction and convection. One of them does not require a medium, radiation. Radiation travels in empty space, in basically a vacuum. How do we know that? If you look at the sky tonight, you will see a bunch of stars in the sky, a lot of them, about 2,000 of them that you can see by, with the naked eye. The only reason why you can see that is because the radiation can travel in vacuum, because there is nothing between us and those stars. And that radiation, which is really light, has been traveling for a long, long time, sometimes uh, a few years since it left. Sometimes it's uh, uh, as far as probably uh, several hundred years. I mean, if you look at, uh, for example, uh, Betelgeuse, which is tonight should be around the northern, no, I'm sorry, the southern sky, a little bit to the southern sky in the middle of the, 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 the sky. If you look at it, that was about 400 years ago or 500 years ago since light has left it. But the point being in here, it travels through empty space. So that is radiation, which is light, really. Okay? So that is one way for, uh, for heat to transfer, transfer in the form of radiation. It transfers also in the other two forms, convection. Convection is the motion of fluids, of gases. Okay? So if you ever put, a, put, a, put a soup or even water, trying to boil it on the, on the stove, you turn on the stove, and in that case, the stove has heat coming off of it, which is the heat usually is in contact with the surface underneath of it, with the, the pot, basically. So in that case, the heat is in the, from the bottom of the pot transfers to the, to, the, to the pot itself, to the inside of the pot, via conduction. Usually, uh, pots are made out of uh, metals. Nowadays, they make them out of aluminum because aluminum is actually a good conductor, good conductor of electricity, which is also a good conductor of heat. So now the heat is now in contact with the bottom of the, of the fluid, whatever you have in there. Let's say water, for example, trying to boil water. Now that temperature starts to grow. So the density now of that part of the fluid start to get less and less because now the temperature is rising. Since this is temper the, the density is less than the average fluid, this will, will, will rise up because again the buoyancy in this case is going to make it because it's less dense than the fluid so it's going to rise up okay uh, uh, and the denser fluid will fall in in the same thing at time to fill up the gap when it reaches the top of the fluid at that point it's going to be in contact with the air which is lower temperature than the surface of the pot so in this case its density starts to be denser it starts to be a to increase because its temperature is lower. Again, it's going to be more dense than the one in the bottom, and the one in the bottom comes up and replaces it, and it all falls and it goes in cycles. If you reach the boiling temperature, you will see actually bubbles start to form. The bubbles are actually pockets of air in there that are so light that it's going to go and rise all the way up to the surface. So the point being in here, this circulation actually is what we talk about and we call convection. Convection is a very important process in weather phenomena. We, uh, that's how basically uh, uh, large masses of air move from place to place on Earth and with it takes uh, temperature and heat basically and spread it around the Earth. And that is basically what weather is. It's also a critical uh, part of the process and uh, under the surface of the Earth, under the crest. Uh, 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 there is basically a big circulation of rock that is super hot in the bottom in contact with the core of the earth. And then uh, the top rocks are actually at a lower uh, temperature because they are closer to the, uh, to the crest. So in this case, what happened, there is a circulation except that it takes a long time for rocks to move. But it's still, that explains it's still convection, albeit extremely slow. And that is how the earth actually uh, 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 regenerates surface basically all the time, making a new surface because of this motion, because of the convection. It's also critical motion, critical uh, aspect of heat transfer in the sun and stars like the sun, where basically if you look at the, 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 the thin layer of the sun, which is like the crest basically in this case, where it's sitting at 6,000 Kelvin, about actually 5,500 Kelvin, so that is the temperature, but inside the core of the sun, it's several million degrees, actually about 10, 20, maybe to 100 million degrees inside the core of the sun because of the nuclear reactions. So now you have a core that is super hot. You have a surface, although we call it hot, 5,500 5, degrees will boil anything, okay? 
So if you put any metal in there, it's going to basically uh, evaporate very quickly at that temperature. But it's a lot colder than the core of the sun. So in this case, you have a convection also motion of the fluids that are in the layer above the core that takes the heat from the super hot in the bottom of the sun and dumps it into the outside, which is a lot cooler, cool down and forth. So it's just like what's going on in your in your in your uh, in your uh, oven, basically, <laughs> similar to what's going on in the in the uh, in the uh, in the kitchen. So that is, in a sense, how these three processes are. So you have the conduction, convection, and uh, radiation. Turns out the convection is a little bit hard mathematics to work with because of the fact that it involves a lot of material and a lot of masses and it involves gases, but you can come up with theories for it too. So in terms of math, usually we have the conduction, which is easy, and the radiation to some extent, which is ED, easy, and we have those things to work with. But that's basically in a nutshell how heat is transferred. Then we talk about Newton's law of cooling. Newton's law of cooling, you know about it every day. You take your coffee and you put it on the stove or you put it on the kitchen top or you put it on the table or something like that. If it was too hot, it's going to cool down after a while. It doesn't matter. If you have a lot of coffee, it's going to take more time to cool than if you have a small amount of it. So this, this cooling is proportional to the amount of matter that you have, number one. And it's also um, uh, proportional to the gradient of temperature. So if you bring it extremely hot versus a, a, a medium that is not that hot, the speed with which it's going to come down, not the actual difference in temperature, not the actual cooling, the speed with the rate at which it's going to go is going to be higher, okay? So this is basically Newton's law of cooling, and he discovered it basically by studying these things. We talk about the greenhouse effect, which is a real effect. I mean, this is science, this is not the politics. And the idea behind it is the following. Materials absorb radiation of all sorts, okay? All frequencies. And then when they absorb them, they get excited. The material itself basically moves to a different energy level than what its ground state is. So what it does after that, it re-emits the radiation. When it re-emits, it doesn't emit it back into the same wavelength that it receives it. Now, the, the materials in general, they have, uh, they have properties that depend in terms of how much they absorb and how much they uh, uh, reflect depends on their internal properties. Some materials are transparent actually for certain wavelengths, like glass, for example. We use it for windows. It, uh, it, it transmits the visible light. That's why when you look outside the window, you can see the trees outside and you can see the people walking and everything because it's transparent for that visible light. If you look through the wall, for example, or through my hand, you're not gonna see anything hidden behind it because my hand is again, not transparent, but it's opaque when it comes to visible light. So that is one thing. Now, the same glass that is actually transparent for visible light is actually opaque for other frequencies, like for example, the infrared. The infrared does not go through glass, okay? So it's going to be reflected just like, like the other things, like the, like, as if it's a wall basically in this case, or a flat mirror is going to bounce it back. So here is the problem. You have radiation of very long wavelength, visible light that is, and anything else, goes through the glass. It's absorbed inside the material, then the material gets excited, emits it back. When it emits, it doesn't emit visible. It emits uh, actually infrared. So when it goes back into the glass, it's not going to go. It's going to be re reflected back. It's going to bounce back. So when it's, it's basically trapped, whatever that device is. So this is the essence of greenhouse effect. This is actually a very, very useful effect for agriculture. Without it, we could not have had agriculture. Without it, actually, life could not have existed on Earth. Because if Earth was re-emitting all the radiation it has, basically, at the daytime, it's going to be super hot. During nighttime, it's going to be super cold. Nothing can live in those conditions. So greenhouse effect, to some extent, is good. But too much of it can be deadly. Here is two extremes. Planet Mars does not have none. It's super inhabitable in because of that. It's super cold during nighttime. During daytime, sometime in, uh, on, on Mars, it's like here. I mean, it's like 20 degrees here on Earth in the summer. Sometimes, not all the year, though, you, though, because it doesn't really have a lot of atmosphere to retain the heat. So in this case, basically, Mars is actually not good because it does not have any greenhouse whatsoever. 
greenhouse effect whatsoever. On the other extreme of the, uh, the, the, the side of the story is Venus. It has too much of it. It has a lot of it. So the surface is unbearable on Venus because of the same thing, because now you have a lot of it. Namely, radiation go in, never go out. So the surface is super, super hot. Even the, 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 the Russian pioneer, oh no, uh, I forgot the name for it exactly right now. When it landed there, it only survived for a few minutes on Venus because of the extreme heat. Nowadays, NASA and everybody else who are thinking to go to, to Venus, they have to devise materials that could sustain several hundred degrees of temperature and uh, basically be able to, uh, you cannot have, for example, regular semiconductors. You cannot have probes like we have them in here and put them on there because they will melt. So you really have to have extremely durable materials that's probably made out of ceramic or something like that that can, uh, that can uh, survive those extreme conditions. But the point being in here is that you have two extremes of the, the same thing, which is really useful, but to some extent, which can be also counter- uh, effective. Now, the thing with the greenhouse effect on Earth, it's a real thing. We have temperature that has been steadily increase, increasing on Earth, and there is scientific evidence for it. So this is not politics or anything like that. This is a real deal. So we really have to be careful with our case in here, not to go all the way to the extreme like Venus did, and then all of a sudden now we have a problem then later on that life cannot be sustained on the same planet. Venus and Earth, they are actually very, very similar in size, very similar in conditions, and it's not because Venus is closer to the Earth that is a lot hotter. No, it's because it has a big greenhouse effect. That's why it has that problem in terms of temperature. In terms of average temperature, if it were just for the distance, slightly higher than the Earth. That doesn't justify what's going on in it. Okay. The second part, which is chapter 17, we're going to be talking about phase, phases of matter. There are actually four phases of matter. And this is the item of topic today that you need to list them. And they are basically uh, solids, liquids, gases, and plasma states. So we're going to go through them and the difference between them. And this is what I want you guys to remember from this discussion too. In addition, the other item is going to deal with the, uh, the three ways for, uh, for how heat transfers from location to location. Okay. And then uh, we're uh, going to uh, talk about the evaporation, which is really a process with which basically heat is transferred also. Okay. Energy is transferred from a medium to another. I have a question. Yes. So what were, what were the two items are, uh, of the discussion? I did not. I was just talking in general. The two items, the first one, the first one has to do with the, the three ways of heat transfer, which are this. And the second one has to do with the phases of matter. And we're get, going to get to them. And they are basically the four phases of matter are solids, liquids, gases, and plasma states. Okay. Okay. One of the uh, three things. Okay. The, Thank uh, you. Four phases. So evaporation and condensation are both methods for basically uh, exchange of heat, also for materials to lose heat, and that's why we perspire actually is because we're too hot. We want to get rid of that heat. Okay. So for animals that don't perspire, they have to find ways of getting rid of that excess heat somehow. And then uh, boiling points and melting and freezing. And the energy and changes of phase, basically, when a material goes through phase transformation, it either, either needs energy to go from a lower uh, state, basically, from a solid to liquid or a liquid to gas or a gas to plasma, or back in the opposite direction, get rid of that excess heat to go from, again, the other, the, the other way around. So that is basically of how, get rid of energy, I should say, not heat. Heat is just one way, one form of energy. Okay. Objects in thermal contact at different temperatures tend to reach a common th temperature in three ways. So if you bring two objects that have different temperatures, that you can clearly say yourself that this is hotter than the other. If you wait long enough for them, they will reach equilibrium. They will be, they will feel the same, the same temperature. How do they do that? How do they transfer their uh, energy between one another so that they reach that equilibrium? Is through one of these three ways. So this is the first item that I want you guys to uh, mention here because this is one of the important points of today's lecture, okay? 
So the three ways are conduction, convection, radiation. Conduction, convection require medium. Radiation does not. Radiation can travel in vacuum, okay? Can go through a vacuum. Does not require a uh, case in point. We receive heat all every day from the sun and the sun. There is no physical contact between us and the sun. There is no wire that is connected between us and the sun. There is nothing, no, no, no. So the only thing that we have between us and the sun is vacuum. And so therefore we get our energy mainly through the form of radiation. We get it also through the form of convection and conduction via the surface of, uh, via the earth because the earth itself is actually has its own uh, heat source inside. So it has a little bit of a heat source, but it's negligible compared to what we receive on a daily basis from the sun. Again, conduction requires materials touching one another. And it's really due to the, uh, the electrons, that's it. The electrons are the ones in a metal, especially in the, the case of metals, because metals are good conductors of heat. If you take this metal, for example, and you put it in so, for a uh, source of heat, like for example, the fire that I had earlier, and you put your finger on the other side, you will see that after a while, it, your hand starts to get warmer and warmer because heat is coming from the hot source to the cold source, okay, to you. So that is basically how heat is transferred from place to place in three, the, the, the electrons and good conductors of heat are good also conductors of electricity and vice versa. Because the same agent, the same cause, which is uh, in this case electrons are the ones that are used in this case for both mechanisms. Sometimes you don't want conduction. Sometimes you want insulation instead. So in this case, you would want materials that, that don't transfer heat, like for example, wood or uh, air, which is actually a good insulator too. Except in the case of air, you have the other process which is involved, convection. So if you can guarantee there is no convection, then there is no transfer of heat. However, because convection can come into play too, that's how heat is transferred too. So if you put air in between you and the other source of heat, well, you're gonna feel the waves of heat coming at you through the, uh, through the uh, convection process, okay? So good conductors conduct heat. Substances with loosely held uh, electrons transfer energy quickly to other electrons through the solid. Good conductors of heat are silver, for example, which is a good conductor of electricity. Copper, which is a good conductor of electricity, is also a good conductor of heat and other solid metals. So basically all of the metals that are good conductors of electricity, they are good conductors of heat because a metal by definition is a material that has uh, uh, available electrons to move around. Uh, poor, conductors, poor conductors are also good insulators. Like I said, sometimes, for example, you are in a cold weather and you have a heater going on at home. So you don't want the heat to escape outside because then you're not going to keep uh, warm. It's going to be lost. The heat is going to be lost. And then at the end, the room will go down. So in this case, you really want insulation. Glass is a good insulator. Wool is good insulator. Wood is paper, cork, plastic, foam, and air. Again, you have to be cautious about some of these materials because of the fact that they could conduct heat through other ways other than necessarily the, uh, the, uh, the uh, conduction, okay? Substances that trap air are good insulators like wool, for example, fur, feathers, and that's what animals, for example, in the, in the Arctic, they do. Actually, they have hair during the winter to keep them basically from losing their own heat that is very expensive for them to generate. If you hold one end of a metal bar against a piece of ice, the end in your hand will soon become cold. Does cold flow from the ice to your hand? Always heat transfer. So if you sit on a bench, for example, and the bench happened to be on the outside, which is on a cold day, in this case, you feel cold, not because somehow you're getting the cold or receiving cold or cool, uh, you're getting colder because of it. No, because of somehow there is a transfer from the bench to you. It's actually a transfer from you to the bench and your atoms now that were uh, moving at a higher velocity on average than what they were before you set. Uh, no, I'm sorry, they're moving a slower velocity before you set. So when you when you were standing, you had more motion in your, in your molecules and your atoms and your electrons 
when you sit down, they start to basically wiggle a little less than what they were doing before. That is what you're feeling, actually. That is what you feel in this case. That is what you express as cold, but it's actually less heat in you. I mean, less temperature in you because of the heat that you lost. Insulation doesn't pre prevent the flow of internal energy. It slows it down only. No matter how good of an insulator you have, you always have leaks in it. That is part of the, of the nature of it. So good insulator is not a perfect insulator, but it is as close as you can get from perfect, basically, because there is always transfer of heat, no matter what. Even in the case of electricity, good insulators of electricity, no matter how good they are, and there's uh, uh, enough stress and the difference of potential, they gave in, case in point, lightning. Air is an insulator of electricity, but with the buildup of charges in the, in, the, in, the, in the cloud, they can come so much, they can become so high actually, that they can break uh, the air, which is an insulator and make it a conductive. And you see that in the flash of lightning. So that is true for electricity and it's true here too because of the stress, the difference in temperature that gets hot, higher and higher between the inside and outside, ultimately there is a loss of heat, of heat even in the presence of the best insulation that you can have or vice versa. For example, if you want to keep cool inside and the outside is super hot, in this case, you would want the insulation also to prevent heat to come in. No matter how good of an insulation, you still have some, some leaks of heat from outside to inside. And in this case, you still have a problem there. The only way to slow it down is actually when we look at that Newton's law of cooling, that is actually when you're going to be at an advantage by lowering, for example, in the case of an AC, lowering the gradient of temperature. If the outside, for example, for example, is 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, in the inside, for example, you would want it to be like, for example, super cold, 40 degree Fahrenheit. Then in this case, there is a 60 degree Fahrenheit gradient. No matter how good of an insulation, you're going to have a problem. Your AC will work extremely hard to maintain that gradient and it will not. As a matter of fact, it will probably fail. It's going to stop working. So what you do in this case, make it the gradient a little less. Instead of making it 40 degrees, make it, let's say, for example, 50 degrees or 60 degrees or 70 degrees or 87 degrees. In this case, the gradient is a lot less. So your AC will work less to maintain that because there is, there is less escape or less uh, 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 entrance in this case of heat from outside and vice versa for the heating stage. If the outside, for example, is super cold and let's say, for example, the 20s, some places, for example, in California and the mountains, they can do that easily in the winter. And you would want, no, I want to be a nice 93 degrees. Well, in this case, your AC unit, I mean, your heater in this case would have to work extremely hard to reach that level because of the insulation or lack thereof, okay? That you cannot have a perfect insulator. So that is always true and it's true for electricity as much as it's true for, 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 uh, for, uh, for heat. This is a trick that is used a lot. It's because actually coal is not uh, that great of a conductor anyway. Okay, as long as you don't stay too long on it. So this is convection. This is a second way for heat to transfer. Actually, it's the motion of the gases in here. Okay, this is what I was describing earlier in terms of a pot for immediately in contact with the source sitting at a higher temperature versus in here that is sitting at lower temperature. And the way this is working is basically the less dense fluid will rise and the more dense fluids will come in. Once it comes in in contact with the, uh, the, uh, the hot source, then its density also becomes less, in which case it's going to rise and you have this circulation. Usually you will have two adjacent bubbles going uh, backward. One of them is clockwise, uh, counterclockwise in this case, and another one that is clockwise immediately next to one another. So you see bubbles basically adjacent one or to one another. And you can actually visualize it in here, like this shimmer in here in this different temperature, different uh, temperature media. Because warm air expands, and that's why you have it less dense and it buoyed, because the density is less than the surrounding uh, air or the surrounding uh, uh, liquid. And then it rises until its density equals to that surrounding. That's exactly when it stops. That's if you look at smoke. 
you will see the smoke rising, but at some point it levels, it doesn't rise anymore, because at that point it reached a point where its density is that of, that of the earth environment next to it. Otherwise it's going to go forever and ever and ever. So there is no, uh, no way for it to stop, okay? This is a mechanism. Do not try this one in, at home unless you are very, very well warned and ready for the, uh, for the next day. If you have a pressure cooker that has been sitting on the stove for a long time, building up pressure in there and temperature, so P and uh, T will increase one by one. The volume is fixed. Usually with the pressure cooker, you, you tighten it first and you turn on the heat. So in this case, as the pressure is increasing, the temperature also is increasing with it. The minute you release that the, the, the mechanism for the air so that it comes out, then it's going to come out very hot from the source and expand. In doing this expansion, its temperature drops. So that's one way for it to get rid of that excess heat from the inside through this expansion. And that's how that is the same phenomenon that is involved in this case with the, with the, uh, with the convection. So that is one way to transfer heat from point to point, okay? If you feel it, you will see that. You will see the temper difference in temperature. So this is an interesting question. Okay. So again, this is uh, the, the, the convection, the process with which we were talking about. Uh, I think we mentioned this last time, didn't we? About the specific heat for the uh, water and the, uh, the the ground. Yeah. Did we mentioned. Yeah. That? Okay. Very good. So this is basically the same thing, but the air mass in here is moving in this during daytime, for example, and at least in this picture, it's moving clockwise. During nighttime, it's moving in the opposite, counterclockwise. And you see, if you do a bonfire, you will see during daytime the bonfire will blow toward the camp and during night is going to blow away from it because of where the ocean is, okay? During nighttime, it's going to blow toward the ocean, daytime is going to blow towards you. So that's how you can uh, see that. It doesn't matter, even during daytime, if this one is colder than the outside, so uh, it's going to be the opposite, okay? So radiation is the last one that uh, were uh, the last of the three that we talk about in terms of uh, heat transfer. Radiation is just the electromagnetic waves. That's it. That is exactly what that is. Light, basically. At least in the visible range, it's light. But materials, no matter how much temperature they have, they uh, radiate energy. As long as they have a finite temperature, they radiate energy. You, me, Anything that is in, inside the room has a temperature right now, so it radiates energy. The, re the reason why we see it in the visible light is because that radiation in this case happened to be peaked around the visible light. That's why we choose, for example, material in here, usually tungsten, and the resistance in here that gets so hot because of the uh, joule heating that it starts to glow in the visible light, and this would work so that you can see light from it. This one, actually, the fire that is coming from here is... You're going to see it, but when, it, when, it, when you turn off the fire, you might not see it, but you can feel the heat. And that is the, is the radiation. As a matter of fact, the heat itself is the infrared radiation. Because the infrared radiation is of the order of a few millimeters, which is the typical size of your organic, basically, uh, molecules. And that's what makes them move around so much. And you can feel that because of the average motion. You can feel that as a form of heat. That's why we use actually the microwave radiation for, for cooking, for example, in microwaves, because of that correlation between uh, those, 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 those frequencies or those wavelengths, to be more specific, and the size of those molecules. So radiation, radiant energy, transferred energy exists as EM waves ranging from long radio waves to short wavelength X-rays. So this is basically the uh, invisible region, it's red to virus. So this is the energy that is radiant, at least most of the part. Sometimes you have some violent phenomena that can produce gamma rays. And uh, those are, uh, they usually happen in typical uh, nuclear reactions and things like that, so you can't really, uh, but 
and the other one is actually the one that is involved with transfer of heat. So we saw the fact that the light is a wave, and that is exactly how this thing is. So these are waves, and they have characteristics with wavelength and also frequency. The higher the frequency, the higher the energy, and the more the energy that is transmitted. Okay. Every object above zero radiates, no matter what that is. So if somebody tells you a radiant today, they are not wrong, regardless of what you think, they are absolutely right. Tell them, yeah, uh, yeah I know, and so are you, okay? Everybody is radiant because of the fact that you radiate energy because your temperature is about room temperature where you're sitting. It's, uh, it's no, I'm sorry, it's not that. It's because your body has a higher temperature than most room temperature. As a matter of fact, this was is used to in, in the in military applications by having the goggles and goggles are specifically sensitive to the infrared radiation that your body emits. And uh, they take that and they translate it to a picture because you can't see infrared, nobody can. So what they do, they take the radiation that is emitted by the, uh, the, the, the human body, which is a little uh, higher than that of the room temperature and or an animal, for example, which is the same thing take that energy and translate it to an image and they can give you an image basically which is usually black and white and sometimes actually with a little bit of uh, shades of gray so that you can tell what shape of, a, of an animal is in there or is it a person or if it's uh, how many of them. So it has military applications, it's used also in hunting, it's used in other applications, surveillance and other things in there because of the fact that everything emits radiation. As long as you look hunting for a specific frequency, you can always find it. So in the case, for example, of uh, uh, animals, you know which frequency you're looking for, and those goggles are made specifically for those frequencies, okay? And you can use it for any object, and that's what we use actually to study objects. And when we turn our telescopes, for example, in the night sky, we'll peak to different frequencies, for example, the X-ray, the sky looks completely different than when we look at it in the infrared, because when we look at it in the X-ray, we will see the most basically uh, strongest sources of energy in the universe in there, and we'll see them different than if we look at it, for example, in radio waves, those are things that are emitting energy at a lot less uh, frequency than the others. But it's still, all of them are uh, sources of energy. From the sun surface comes out light called the EM waves because Light, for some reason, we evolved to be sensitive to what the sun has. That's the radiation that we look at in, in general. So probably if we happen, if we, I don't know, if we have evolved, for example, near Proxima Centauri, which is the red uh, uh, star, I mean, it's a uh, class, what is it, M star, which is red, basically, then probably would be more uh, evolved to the other one, probably will not be able to see the blue and the green colors and any of the other colors will be see different colors in the spectrum. But again, that is basically how evolution probably would have worked. Anyway, from the Earth's surface comes terrestrial radiation in the form of infrared waves, and that is below the threshold of sight, so we cannot see anything that is outside of the visible light. Here is the spectrum law. This is basically the emission of radiation as a function of temperature. This is frequency. Sometimes you will see this graph backward. You will see the peaks this way, uh, uh, peaking in the other direction. And that, if you look in the bottom, you see it's not frequency, but rather it's wavelength. Because the wavelength and frequency are the inverse uh, of one another, OK? An object that is 1,600 Kelvin, we are about 300 Kelvin. I mean, humans are what? About, uh, no, we are at about 400 Kelvin, 350 Kelvin to be more exact. No, I'm sorry, what are we saying about it? No, we are 300 and something only, 350 and 320 Kelvin. So we're peaked way in much lower frequencies than this ones. But that's what the goggles will pick up. 1600 Kelvin is hot temperature, super hot temperature actually. 2400 Kelvin, you cannot see it. You barely start to see trace of it in the in the in this region. It's going to startly barely start. Barely you're going to see parts of it in the visible region. And that's what your eyes are. Thirty-two hundred Kelvin though is going to appear red, dark red, black red, basically. I mean, kind of shaded with the with not not completely red. As you move along with the higher and higher frequencies, you're going to get more and more frequencies. 
So this is basically how the spectrum looks like. So the frequency and the temperature are proportional to the one another. This is the peak frequency. So F bar in here means where it's maximum. So as the temperature increases, the peak frequency increases. It gets hotter and hotter and higher and higher and higher. So for a star, for example, like the sun, 5,500 Kelvin, 5,500 Kelvin peaks exactly in the middle of the visible region. Another star, for example, Rigel, peaks actually more than that. So stars, they can appear with different shades of color. If you look, for example, at, at uh, Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse peaks similar to about less than the sun, but around a little over this temperature. So the period of Betelgeuse, the surface temperature of Betelgeuse is less than that of the sun. That's why if you look at it, it looks kind of yellowish. I mean, orangey probably at all. So if you have had a chance to look at it, if you have never seen a Betelgeuse, this is actually a good time for you to look at it in the night sky because it's actually in a very good suitable place where you can go and actually look at it. So uh, actually, don't, don't, don't be confused with Mars. Mars is a planet. It doesn't, I mean, its color is uh, uh, orangey because of its surface, because of basically what it's made up of. It's not because mainly of its temperature. This one is because of their temperature. That's why they grow this way. That is how we came up with the so-called black body radiation to study this, this objects like the sun, for example, okay? 500, 500 degrees, this is kind of cool. And then, when the temperature rises, it gets chipped toward the blue and then hot. Usually for some reason in our culture, anything that is red, we call it hot. Anything that is blue, we call it uh, cool. And that is opposite to what it is actually. <laughs> in reality, red is actually less warm than the blue. Blue is actually hotter than red, at least in terms of uh, wavelengths and frequencies. Okay. So this is opposite to what the culture is. So the absorption occurs with emission of radiant energy effects of surface. Any material that absorbs more than it emits, it's a net absorber. Any material that emits more than it absorbs, that's a net emitter. Like the sun, for example, it's a net emitter, okay? If you look, for example, at the moon, it actually uh, receives, but then emits back some of the frequencies. Net absorption is relative to temperature of the surrounding. So if the surrounding is cooler than the object, the object is a net emitter in this case. If the surrounding is actually uh, uh, hotter than the, uh, than the object, the, uh, in this case, the object is a net absorber. Net absorber. It absorbs more radiation than it emits. Good observer, absorbers are also good emitters. Poor absorbers are also poor emitters. This is all leading to a concept which is a, a reflection of radiation op opposite of uh, to absorption. So here is the deal. Radiation hits the material. Part of it is reflected, the other part is absorbed. The sum of the two is the incoming, okay? So that is basically in a nutshell what it is. So in here, we have a good, uh, example of that, okay, which is, this is actually a model called the black body. And this model was uh, to help us basically understand what's going on in terms of, 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 uh, of stars, for example, objects that emit radiation like stars and things like that, okay? So in here, we have radiation that comes in. This is a model. This is not uh, necessarily, a, uh, it helps us to understand that law that I was talking about, this one, okay? So uh, why the radiation is peaked in certain frequencies when the temperature changes, the peak changes. So in this model, basically what we're saying in here is that radiation when it comes in, the inside of this body is made up of perfect reflectors, metals basically, that the radiation is trapped in there forever and ever. So this is a perfect absorber. Now, if we open it back, it's, again, it's going to emit all of the radiation. So this is basically the model with which we worked with. And this is the, really the one that led to the uh, onset of quantum mechanics. This was the one that led to modern physics. I mentioned Newton's law of cooling, approximately proportional to the temperature difference between the object and its surrounding. In short, rate of cooling is proportional to delta T. The greater the ingredient, the faster. 
the, 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 the cooling is going to occur. So that is basically how this is a, uh, you can understand this one. Of course, it's proportional also to the amount of matter too. We used to do an experiment with this one. I don't know if we are going to have a physics 11 next semester on campus in terms of a lab. I'm hoping everything will be on campus, including lectures, man. This is, anyway, that's, that's uh, we, we, do, we do this experiment on campus, it's fun. So again, cooling and warming are opposite to one another. So whatever applies to cooling applies to uh, warming. I mentioned the greenhouse effect, for example, the case of a glass, it's transparent when it comes to the visible light. Visible light is typically shorter wavelengths than the infrared light. So the material now absorbs that radiation. For example, if you look at the yellow flower, what's going on in this case, it absorbs all frequencies with the exception of yellow, reflects it back. And materials in here absorb material, a lot of, even some of the yellow is actually absorbed by it. So in this case, radiation is absorbed by the material inside the greenhouse. When it's emitted, it's going to be emitted in a usually uh, different wavelengths because we will see that when the material absorbs energy, it gets excited to a higher level. But instead of going back to the same way that it came in, it goes through several transitions of shorter, I mean, of uh, uh, less gap in the energy level. So less energy, less frequency, longer wavelengths. So the wa wavelengths that are emitted back are not in the same very high frequency. So it absorbs high frequency, which is in the case of visible. When it transition back, transition back through steps back to its ground state. So in each time it emits shorter, uh, I mean, less amount of energy corresponding to longer wavelength, actually. And that's what you see in here uh, depicted is longer wavelength. Well, glass in this case is actually opaque as far as this material is, okay? It's going to bounce it back. Is actually going to reflect it back. It's a reflector for this radiation. So now that energy, there is a net energy coming in and very little going out. So in this case, there is an increase in energy inside. And this is exactly what the greenhouse effect is. So this is actually a useful effect that is used in, 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 uh, in uh, agriculture. But it's undesirable when it comes on the planet level. At least you have to have it controlled. You don't want it to be a runaway anyway, it's gonna be a problem. So understanding greenhouse effect requires two concepts, all things radiate at a frequency and therefore wavelength that depends on the temperature of the emitting object. Transparency of things depends on the wavelength of radiation. This you probably have experienced it in the car. In the hot day, the car gets hotter. If you open the door a little or if you leave the, the, the if you open the door, what's going on in this case, you have convection, air coming in to actually, uh, 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 because it's higher temperature inside the car and less temperature outside. So the air outside is more dense than the air inside. So it's going to come and you have convection that's gonna help you uh, reduce the temperature a little. But if you step out, the temperature is better, okay? This is on the planet level, same thing, okay? The earth gets hot. Usually it gets back of the heat in the form of, of a longer wavelength. And if we have too much of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which are mainly carbon dioxide and water, then uh, heat is going to be reflected back to the earth. It's not gonna be leaving the earth and then the temperature starts to increase. Global warming is a terrestrial uh, basically phenomenon related to radiation. It's radiated, re radiated energy unable to escape, so a warming of the earth occurs. Long-term effects on climates are of present concern, okay? There is a lot of studies to support that this is actually a real deal, not a, not a bogus thing like some politicians want us to believe. Solar energy, because of the fact that we're receiving a lot of amount of radiation, as a matter of fact, every square meter receives about uh, a little over a thousand, uh, what is it, kilowatts? No, a thousand, I think, well, I forgot the number exactly right now, 1400 or something like that uh, per, per meter squared, for 1400 watts per meter squared. So that's a lot of energy. What is how many joules per second actually we're receiving? So we're receiving a huge amount of energy. 
and you can collect it and mine it and convert it into useful energy for the for the earth actually with or without our help it's it's happening i mean planets do that anyway plants do that anyway they take energy and they convert they take the energy from the sun and convert it to a uh, essential nutrients nutrients that other animals and humans basically consume and they convert that to energy anyway so that's happening on uh, whether we like it or not but if we have industrial uh, i mean uh, industrial applications like this one that's actually even better and it's an abundant form of energy okay uh, again i mentioned this is uh, the other topic of the day that matter exists in four common phases solids liquids, gases, and plasma. Did we mention this last time? I thought that this was a topic of last time too, no? That was a discussion of the, yeah, the last time we had. Yes, okay. So at least we need to go through this understanding now that there are these four phases and matter transfer from one case to the other, to the other, to the other, okay? So again, Matter goes by uh, uh, basically uh, absorbing energy, going from a solid state to a liquid state, to a gas state, to a plasma state, okay? If uh, it gets rid of that excess energy, it goes back basically from plasma state to the gas state, to a liquid state, to a solid state. Not necessarily straight, not necessarily in this order. It could go from gas to solid and from solid to gas or phases transformations is a little bit complicated that sometimes have can occur not exactly in that order okay so here is for example an evaporation in this case and also condensation so material now that is in a one state one phase can go to the other state because this atom has an excess energy it takes that energy away with it so the 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 the, the gas in this case or whatever is behind it liquid water in this case is, uh, is left with less energy. So that is actually because this one that has that excess energy took it with it and went to the vapor state, went to the gas state. And this one now has less energy, so it's going to come back in here and also take from that energy. Both of them, they're resulting in energy going this way. Both of them are actually going into the energy being lost in this case, okay? So this is one way to get rid of that excess energy so now this is a phase transformation. If you, you, you reduce its energy, then it's going to move in this way too. So both of them, they're getting rid of energy or uh, 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 losing energy in this way too. So if you look at it from the vantage point of water, so in this case also it's losing ener energy and becoming liquid. In this case also it's losing energy and becoming liquid in this format. The difference between these phases is really has to do with the bonding of the different uh, components of that material. So what's going on inside the liquid is that you have inside, first of all, a solid, you have really strong bonding between the nearest neighbors that can can go for several molecules or several particles down the road. OK, so in this case, it's called a long range order because of the fact that if something happens to this atom, not only its immediate neighbor will know about it, but the one that are further down the road, they will know about it. So if this one vibrates a little, it's going to impact the motion of this one, which is going to impact the motion of that one. So this is why this is called the long range order because it's, 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 it's affecting everybody. On the other hand, in the case of a liquid, for example, water, if something happens in here, only its immediate neighbors will know about it. It's called the short range order in the case of liquids, because only immediate neighbors will know about. There is, there, is, there, is, there is interaction between the atoms and the molecules that are very close from one another, but not on a very far away range. So if one of them, uh, is, uh, for example, is, is going through an agitation, through thermal agitation, the one next to it will know about it, but the one immediately next to that probably barely will notice it, and the ones after that will not. So this is a short range order. In the case of gases, there is no order. There is no interaction between them. Each and every one of them is moving on its, on its own. So this is, in a nutshell, the difference between the three phases. Now, in the case of the plasma state, basically what's going on in this case is you don't, the atoms are so much excited that they lose their electrons. They're actually, they're being impacted. So now you have ions floating every which way. And that is a case of flames, for example, okay? 
animals, and we were just talking about this one and how uh, uh, phases, uh, how matter loses energy in the form of uh, evaporation. They use that to their advantage to cool down. Okay, if you sweat, that is actually your system is getting too hot. So it's trying to get rid of that excess of energy by just converting the outside into liquid, which is evaporated later on. So if you put liquid on your, on your surface, and that liquid is going to evaporate, it's going to take the, the heat with, with it. But if you can't produce that liquid on your own, you better go and get it somewhere, okay? And this is what some animals do, okay? Uh, sweat glands produce perspiration, water on our skin absorbed by uh, heat as evaporation cools the body, helps to maintain a stable body temperature. In this case, what they do, put a lot of liquid in here on your body, and that is going to evaporate, taking with it the heat that you would want. Sometimes these animals, they have their veins, and they're, I mean, they're complicated systems. They're way outside of the scope of physics with their ears and blood systems that pump the blood into there and basically get rid of that excess heat in there too, okay? I mentioned sublimation earlier, but I didn't name it. It's a form of phase change, uh, change directly from sol solid to gas. So what I was talking about in here, what is that uh, diagram? From solid to gas, that is sublimation. You don't go through the liquid stage. Case in point is dry ice. Okay. Dry ice, carbon dioxide molecules. So you go, or moth, okay? So frozen water also can do that too. Condensation is the other way around. It's the opposite. Opposite evaporation, warming, uh, process for a gas or liquid, gas molecules near a liquid surface and so that they condense in this case. So all of it has to do with the transfer of energy really when you think about it. So again, when they lose a little bit, uh, when the temperature becomes low, they slow down just enough to form bonding and those bonding becomes now liquid basically in a sense, okay? So that is how the process is for condensation. It's the opposite of the, uh, of the, uh, of the evaporation, okay? Uh, how the bubbles form again, now you have this so a rapid evaporation from underneath the surface, now it happens so fast, now bubbles start to form in there, which is now there is an evaporation. So now you're dealing with actually a gas in here. That gas is actually uh, evaporated uh, water. So it's our water sitting now in the gas form. It's going to form a bubble and it's expanding because of the energy that it has internally. Of course, there is a pressure on it from all around this liquid and that bubble now starts to rise because of the buoyancy and then puffs when it gets to the surface and more and more bubbles start to form because of this rapid basically uh, evaporation that is happening inside. So this is not necessarily what I was talking about at the begin with, which is a slower process, the, the one which is a convection. So in this case, it's the temperature has reached so high of a point in, in the contact in here that the air expands so fast that it's changed transformation and goes for a change phase from uh, liquid to uh, gas. And this gas is the one that is rising now in the form of bubbles. So all of this is just the explanation of that. And you can actually follow the bubbles as they rise and they puff and then more and more form underneath. The boiling point, of course, depends on the temperature. That's why, for example, things that happen in Denver, water does not uh, boil at 100 degrees Celsius, but rather at 95 degrees Celsius. So if you ever happen to live in a mountain area and you were wondering why my rice is not cooking, it's because of this, okay? Because it's not reaching the proper temperature for it to start boiling. The water will, will, will evaporate, will basically boil away before uh, your rice cooks. So. I don't know, you have to put it probably in a pressure cooker or something like that to keep the water from going away. 
Again, I mentioned this as part of the process of how energy is exchanged to go from one phase to the other phase and vice versa, the opposite. Again, this is just an explanation of that and why I have in lines in here. Okay. Heat of fusion is the amount of heat needed to transfer uh, 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 one gram of a substance, okay? So that is basically what the heat of fusion is. For example, for a fusion of water, you need 334 joules per gram. So the amount of heat in which is a substance from solid to liquid. And it's usually it's the same amount for the, uh, for the, uh, for the evaporation, okay? Sorry, fusion to go from uh, solid to liquid and the evaporation from liquid to gas. Okay. What I meant to say in here is that the fusion, which is going from uh, solid to liquid, is the same amount, amount of energy going from liquid to solid. So uh, 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 fusion and uh, freezing are opposite to one another. And in this case, evaporation and uh, or uh, yeah, evaporation and condensation are the opposite to one another. So the amount of, amount of heat that is needed to evaporate is the same amount of heat that is going to be extracted during the process of uh, of uh, condensation. Okay. So those are the things. So in here, obviously, this number is a lot higher than the previous number. We usually use water as a typical, but it's also true for all materials in here. All of these questions are related to these points. I uh, I know you have a lot of quizzes and a lot of assignments related to this to this subject, so I'm going to make sure that you have covered in terms of the quizzes. You have enough quizzes to cover all of these topics, so I'm relying on you to go and not rely on just these powerpoints, which are available already for you guys on on Canvas. Uh, but to go actually on the book and go thoroughly in answering those questions and answering those questions that I have posted for you guys. Do we have an assignment for this week? Let me check quickly in here. Yeah, we have uh, an assignment. Let me open it. That covers pages 298 and 317 and it deals with all of these questions. Please, if you are, this is not an exam, by the way. This is just for you guys to learn. When, when I say it's a homework, it's unlike a quiz. When it says homework, this is not a test. This is something to help you practice and learn the topic. So you can work together. You can look at Google. You can take all the time you want to. As a matter of fact, you can ask me questions if you're still struggling with it or don't know how to answer it. And I, I, I will communicate it with everybody else if I think that this is something that is worth uh, for everybody else. If you're having issues, technical issues or something here and there, that's fine. But this is basically in a nutshell what this purpose of this homework. And like quizzes which are timed and they are actually to test what you have learned and the exams also which are also timed and they are also test uh, knowledge retention. Homework assignments are meant to for you to reinforce what you have learned. So if you wish to work in a team, there is no harm in it. As a matter of fact, I encourage you to do so. And uh, if you want me to facilitate, I will be more than happy to facilitate if I, there is a way for it. The only thing I require for that is that you have to stay in compliance with the guidelines of the health experts and the county requirements and the college requirements in terms of gathering together. Okay. So you have your two questions of the day. And uh, we still have another chapter 17 and another chapter 18 that are due before the spring break. I'm hoping that we are going to have them and also have enough uh, practice on them. And when we come back from the spring break, which is next week is a regular week. This week is a regular week. The week after that one is actually next week. The week after next week is actually where the uh, spring break is which I hope you guys will enjoy. And then we will meet after that. You guys don't have classes tomorrow, do you? No. No. Uh, yeah, I know it's a holiday. Well, enjoy your holiday tomorrow. And I will see you guys Thursday, OK? Thank OK, you. see ya. Thank you. See ya. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank you.
a problem. Let me stop sharing the screen in here. I mean, stop the recording, I should say.